Welcome. Everything is Janet. You are listening to Fork and Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian Janet. And I'm Jason Janet. We'll be the Janets of your afterlife. Today we're talking about Season 3, Episode Janet. I mean, Episode 10, Janets. This episode was written by Josh Siegel and Dylan Morgan, directed by Morgan Sackett, and it aired Janet. It aired Jeremy Baramy. I mean, when did it even air? We don't know. Well, it's a mystery. It's the dot, right? It's everything but also nothing. Or in our terms, December 6th, 2018. 28 Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Welcome back, guys. It's been a, been a bit of a break, a little bit of a hiatus. Yeah, just a little bit of a holiday break and such. Hope you had a lovely holiday with your family. So we will get right back in to this episode. In Janet's Void, the humans discover they've all taken on Janet's appearance. Janet and Michael visit the accounting department, leaving the humans in the void. They encounter a neutral Janet, who introduces them to the head accountant, Neil. Meanwhile, in the void, Eleanor conjures a puppy for an anxious cheaty. Wow. Okay, so right away we know this episode is going to be pretty different from all the others because Darcy Carden is playing like six different people Mm -hmm. in this episode. She's everyone. (laughs) And she's killing it. In an interview, Michael Schur said that he knew that he could do this episode because Orphan Black did it every episode. Yeah. He's like, can we do this? Wait, Tatiana Maslany is like, killed it every time. So we have the technology. We can do this. We can do this. Yes. And Darcy is good enough to do this for sure. Absolutely. It's really fun seeing her embody everybody else. I think personally that... I like her Tahani and her Jason better than the others. Mm -hmm. I just feel like she does such a wonderful job with those two in particular. And maybe it's just that they're more easy to convey because they have certain exaggerated mannerisms. Absolutely, for sure. And Darcy Carden actually said that her favorite person to play was Jason. And the (laughs) hardest was Chidi and Eleanor. Uh, She said the hardest was William Jackson Harper because he has such a specific way of delivering lines with like certain cadence in his voice Mm -hmm. and she found it really difficult. Yeah, he seems like a tough one to copy. I thought she did a pretty good job, though. Like, I I knew that was cheating. I could imagine him doing it. And many times during the episodes, it was kind of like I just forgot that Darcy Carden was being Mm cheating. So I think it was effective. Yeah, for me, Jason Janet was my favorite as well Mm. and i don't know it's something about his stupidity is just so on point but (laughs) it's it's done really well it's just like a multi-layered delivery system of hilarity everyone just it's just pulled off really well Mm -hmm. so we get an actual definition of what janet's void is yes which is a sub-dimension outside of space and time at the nexus of consciousness and matter tethered to my matter obviously i mean duh (laughs) right so if there was like a map of the afterlife hers would be like everything it would be outside of it (laughs) it would be on the other side of the map oh okay it would be on the table that's like across the street from the map sure okay or if you folded up the map and like turned it around and turned it into like an origami bird or something it would be on one of those folds oh okay i got it right so then when you unfolded it it was everywhere and nowhere Ooh, I like that. I like Mm. that. So back in the premiere of season two, Janet said to Jason that he couldn't live with her because she lives in a boundless void. But now we can see that she can bring humans into her void. Just there's going to be some side effects, right? Yeah, they have to die before they get into the void. So Janet says here when she's trying to explain what happened to them, She says that their essences have reconstituted themselves in Janet's form. And I kind of like that. It's a a nod to how most TV shows um, and really media think of personhood as, you know, a person is their mind or their soul or their essence, right? It's not their body. Mm -hmm. Our body is just a vessel Mm -hmm. to carry all of our our goodies. (laughs) goodies yeah you know our mind our heart our spirit our soul etc those are our goodies whenever you say spirit and soul i already like i just imagine like (laughs) honestly the first thing i think of is september the song by earth wind and fire because that has a lot of spirit to me okay 
<laughs> so on top of the four humans that are all played by Darcy Carden for the majority of this episode, she also gets to play neutral Janet, mm-hmm. which I think is really fun. She's kind of she's kind of a mix of Ron Swanson and April Ludgate hmm. from Parks and Rec because she's so no nonsense, like just her blah 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 end of conversation. Very Ron, but then her monotone and kind of like dead eyes are a little bit like April. <laughs> the dead eyes. Yeah. And, and we definitely discussed a neutral Janet. Yes, we have. We have talked about her being in the medium place. Mm-hmm. Right? And what her role would be. And so it's kind of nice to see that Janet realized. Mm-hmm. For sure. So our, our Janet, which uh, apparently is called Janet Proper on the show, uh, says that neutral Janet is the black sheep of the Janet world. So that kind of makes me wonder if Janets have like this annual meeting or like a party where they all interact. It's a family convention. And then all the neutral Janets are kind of just in a corner and they keep saying hello and then end of conversation to each other. <laughs> it, I just, I think that would be funny. To see in like a little flashback at some point, that would be cute. All the Janets just yeah. meeting for maintenance or something. Yeah, for sure. So the part that kind of confuses me a little bit in this first sequence is when Eleanor conjures the puppy. So, yes, she's in Janet's form and she's in Janet's void. But why does she have the ability to conjure stuff? Like that doesn't seem to me that doesn't seem right. Because it's not Eleanor anymore. It's just her consciousness or her herself. So but, but she has. Shouldn't you know any... how to do that? Like, there's some sort of like complicated thing. Oh, Eleanor's not one to think about it. She's just like, well, Janet just thinks of something and it appears. So let's try that. Even though I'm sure that it's a bit more complicated than that. Yeah. But that's why it starts to backfire. Okay. I'm gatekeeping Janet's powers. Mm. I just want Janet to only have the powers. I feel like it's a little weird when maybe her void gives her powers. So being in the void augments anything that's in there. So, you know, you just kind of assume that you have those powers since you're in there. Okay. And of course, Eleanor would be the only one. Well, and Jason kind of with Hmm. enough gall to try it. Yeah, they're bold enough to do it. (laughs) Uh. So we meet Stephen Merchant. Oh, Stephen Merchant. He plays Neil. Love him. Mm-hmm. I only really know him from Portal 2. Yes. As he... Wheatley. Uh, if you haven't played Portal 2, I definitely recommend playing it just because it's a lot of fun, funny, and clever. And yes. Stephen Merchant is fantastic. Oh, he's so funny. I really love his dry sense of humor and <laughs> his kind of glee and everything awkward. Um, I love that he walks up and he's got this mug that says existence's best boss, which is a great little nod to the office, um, which, of course, Michael Schur worked on. If you thought Ted Danson was tall, seeing him standing beside Stephen Merchant is just an eye opener. I know. He just (laughs) dwarfs him. Really, seriously. Ted Danson is around 6'2 and Stephen Merchant is 6'7. 6'7. Oh, to live life that tall. Yeah. All right, you want to keep moving on in the episode? Eleanor asks Chidi if they can talk about their romantic past, but he deflects, saying that Chidi wasn't him. Michael tries to argue that the bad place has tampered with the point system, but Neil refutes this. He believes the system is flawless. He's wrong. He's not wrong. He's dead wrong. He's not wrong. No, he's super wrong. Okay. And I guess we'll get into that discussion (laughs) later. So, in earlier episodes this season, and really in this series in general, Chidi never rejects this notion that he's one single self, um, despite all the reboots. Like, back in season two, when Eleanor is saying, hey, I've basically known you guys for a week, I'm ditching out, I'm going to the medium place, and I'm not staying here on Team Cockroach, Chidi pretty much convinces her by saying, you know that we've been through this exact same thing about 800 times you know it and earlier this season he's reeling from having died and then going to the afterlife and then being rebooted so many times and it seems it seems a little bit like 
obvious, I guess, that Chidi's ignoring his feelings when he says this, just being like, well, that well, that obviously just wasn't me. So, like, pff, we don't need to talk about it. Let's find some philosophy that backs up my urge to not talk about it. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's what kind of, like, it kind of confuses me in this show because, I don't know, there's a lot of, like, to me it makes so much sense that a person is very much defined by, like, a continued consciousness, like their memories and all of this. And they don't have that in this show. And I don't know how to feel about that. Like they don't have it because their memories have been wiped 800 plus times. Exactly. The first season is just gone. We remember it. They don't. So that's an interesting point. Are our characters that we know and love, are they the same characters? Because the first season's gone. So are we, from season two onwards... Do we have to try and empty our memory of those characters because they're gone and we have to learn these new characters? Yeah, so I suppose if they are a bit different, it's because they've been through a different life, right? Up into a certain point. Because, I don't know, it's something I'm I'm wrestling with a little bit, like how I feel about how the show thinks about personhood. And, well, not personhood, but personal identity. Right. Yeah. And there's been a lot of studies on about personal identity and how memory defines who we are, especially in the only really easy way for humanity to do experiments or tests on that or studies uh, is with like coma patients. Mm-hmm. So if, the, if somebody comes out of coma, you know, 10 days, a year, two years, etc., and they're they don't have any memories of the accident leading up to it, or even in some cases like 10, 20, 30 plus years previous. Mm -hmm. Like a mom could wake up not knowing that she'd been a mom for 20 years. Right. And thinks that her daughter is still a newborn, even though she's in her 20s or 30s. Yeah. And like that type of thing, does that change who this person is moving forward? Because their experiences, they have no memory of them. And I think it does. Because I think of people saying... um to others like well they're not their self anymore like or she's she's not really the same person anymore ever since blah 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 right like people change and can change so profoundly and so like quickly Mm -hmm. right from an event like um like sudden onset like dementia or alzheimer's or traumatic experience yep traumatic experience um i don't know I, I'm still wrestling with it because there's a lot of stuff in this episode that kind of, I don't know, contradicts itself. I, I don't know, whatever. Well, to me, it's it's all about Chidi's trying to um, defend himself and saying, you know, I don't want to feel these feelings for you because that's not me, blah, 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 blah. But, and I think also part of him is frustrated because Eleanor has these feelings or these memories and he doesn't. Right. And maybe he's a little, I don't want to say jealous because that's petty, but maybe he's just really frustrated that she's been given these memories back and he feels cheated out. Mm, could be. But at the end of the episode, I feel like we flip flop and Chidi realizes he doesn't really feel like the past Chidi was not the real Chidi. Right. Okay, maybe Chidi is also feeling, because I kind of feel this way as well, um, it, who is Eleanor in love with? Is she in love with the Chidi from that timeline? Like, is she in love with that person with those specific moments and memories and everything? Or does she love this Chidi now? Because... I don't think Eleanor sees a difference. And I don't... Yeah, I think Eleanor doesn't see a difference, but Chidi might. Absolutely. He might be trying to convince her i'm not that person you don't have feelings for me you have feelings for that guy right and i think that's something that a lot of fans argue about when discussing eleanor and chidi it's like if eleanor hadn't seen those memories how would she feel about chidi right now right does she only like him because she knows that she used to like him Mm -hmm. she knows that she fell in love with him because michael blurted it out right do you feel these feelings? Are they real organic feelings or are they kind of being manipulated onto you right. in a way? And then not at the end... A, not in a mean way, but yeah. Well, in the final monologue of him trying to convince Eleanor, 
after she's shape-shifting all through all these people, he keeps on rifling off all these facts about her and how who she is as a person. And I think it's that point that he realizes that he does care about her and because he knows who she is. Doesn't matter what memories he has, he knows who she is. Yeah, he knows this Eleanor in this moment right now. Like, he knows her. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And maybe he's realizing that this Eleanor is the same as the Eleanor he doesn't remember. Mm. And all these memories and the whole philosophy behind it, Hume's box package little, yeah, self. Yeah, a little bundle of Bundle it. of yourself, yeah. yeah. It's all, it, it doesn't matter. It's all just words on paper and then what you really feel and know in your heart can override anything that somebody has written that's a really good point and i think that's what we see in this episode for sure okay so we talked a lot about a gd and eleanor but let's get back to memories memory is a big thing yeah it's it's huge there's Mm -hmm. so many fun movies and discussions about it it's it's great to you know, yep. have an episode that's about what makes us who we are. I can think of so many different shows where there's been like memory wipes, uh, Angel, for example, Fringe, like so many different Buffy. shows, Buffy, where characters are just always portrayed as like just themselves all the time. Doesn't matter if their memory has been wiped. It's just it's still them. Because you know? who we are is a collection of our past experiences and just us just that ineffable us essence i suppose sure, yeah okay. it's a collection of both yeah memento is a great movie that yeah is hugely based on memory and if anyone hasn't seen it go watch it and if you have seen it good for you watch it again <laughs> watch it again and then talk to us about it <laughs> so let's get off of memory for just a sec to talk about What's going on in the accountant's department? So, or the accounting department. So, Neil shows Michael this main feed where all the actions are assigned a moral value. And he talks about a couple that decided to have a destination Lord of the Rings themed wedding. And he jokes that, well, they're basically just doomed now. So, I kind of hope, actually really hope, that the show's going to get address the absurdity of such a thing because it seems ridiculous to me that having a destination lord of the rings themed wedding as maybe tacky as that is or whatever that makes no sense that it would doom you to the after like to the bad place so i think it would be cool if the show didn't just play that kind of thing off as a joke because it is a funny joke we get it but if it had a real purpose in the plot That would be so satisfying, like taking a giant bite of a cake after craving that cake all day. That's how I feel. So it's not just a destination wedding. It's a theme destination wedding. I know. There's nothing wrong with that. Like, do what you want. I think the idea of destination weddings are asking your guests to pay for your to go to your wedding and i think that's the issue that they have oh for sure but i don't think that makes someone a bad person like the there's an issue of money with destination weddings and a lot of people will assume that most people can't go or they provide you know maybe like a whole week's worth of activities for people so that it's really a vacation for everyone whatever yeah and suddenly is lord of the rings makes it even worse yeah. Those are great books and fantastic movies. I mean, come on, let's be <laughs> honest here. They didn't win like 14,000 Academy Awards for nothing. <laughs> wow, that's the exact number, 14,000. Okay, I think it was 14, <laughs> but I embellished a little. <laughs> Send me to the bad place. Well, exactly. See, you would be basically doomed, and that seems ridiculous. You didn't kill anybody. Mm-hmm. You had a, well, not you, but this couple is going to have a destination-themed Lord of the Rings wedding. And they're only thinking about it, by the way. They haven't even done it yet, but they've been assigned a point value and just for already, adding a thought. Yeah, they're already lower on the rung now. So now they're guarding our thoughts. Mm. Yeah, because he says specifically a couple in Japan 
are thinking about having a destination wedding. Oh, no, it's going to be this. Oh, no, it's going to be that. Right? Hmm. That's an invasion of privacy. Yeah. They're in our brains now. Yeah. Should just be actions, not thoughts. Anywho. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it is obviously a bit. Like, it's a bit, of, it's just a gag. Yeah. But it shouldn't be. Yes, I think it should have a real purpose. And I'm really hoping that it does. I doubt it. Oh, come on. Come on, Jason. <laughs> this show has been shattering our expectations since day one. So I have faith that my true wish will come true. Strap yourself in. Buckle up. This Destination Lord of the Ring <laughs> themed wedding is coming back in season five. It better. It better. <laughs> okay. So we'll continue. Chidi says he doesn't want to know about his and Eleanor's life together because it isn't his business. He gives everyone a brief philosophy lesson on personal identity and Eleanor calls him out for avoiding his feelings. Rightfully so. Yeah. I, okay, so obviously we talked about Darcy Carden being so fun in this episode and I really like that she plays nearly everyone and I think that's a really fun just visual joke right but it also gives us a really good opportunity to talk about the self um obviously our characters have never been anyone but themselves in this show i think it's so fun to have everyone not be themselves in this episode because they have been just through this giant like constant state of crisis right in the last few episodes where things have just been moving so quickly for them and so I think it makes perfect sense that all of them are feeling a little bit uneasy about who they are. And maybe Tahani, maybe not so much Tahani or not so much Jason, but like Chidi and Eleanor definitely don't feel like they're on solid ground. And you can sense that in this episode. They're they're worried about themselves. They're, they're acting a little bit different, right? Um, and even Chidi feels just uncomfortable. Like, why am I in this, this white, robot person's body like I don't like this I don't know who I am I don't know what's going on and I can't think about my feelings for Eleanor because I don't even know who I am so who am I to have feelings for someone it's just it's a lot of fun um and of course I mean we've talked at length (laughs) at length because I talk a lot (laughs) <laughs> about personal identity on this podcast um we even talked about it on the first episode of this season so Just a quick, quick recap, real quick. Some philosophers believe that personal identity is determined by someone's soul. Uh, Some feel that it's a person's body. And some people feel that it is a person's continued consciousness that gives them an identity. Um, What do you think, Jason, what do you think that this show believes makes personal identity? That's difficult to say, but I think that what they're trying to show us is that it's not one specific thing. Okay. Because they are literally showing us all these different elements, Mm -hmm. and our characters are still the same. We know that Eleanor is going to be snarky and snide, and we know basically how she's going to react in certain situations, even after a memory wipe. Right. Or even after she is Janet or whatever. Okay. I don't think the show is ever going to take one single stance on what makes us who we are. Yeah. Because I don't think there is one single thing. I think that's fair. Yeah. Um, Because if we look back, like thinking about what philosophers believe, right? And some of them feel it is your body, which... A lot of people argue that doesn't make sense because your cells regenerate every seven years or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, And other people think it's a continued consciousness, so it's your memory. But of course, in this show, we have memory wipes over and over again. Um, So does that make them all different iterations of the same person, like Chidi number 842? Mm Mm-hmm. No, the show's not really doing that. The show is kind of leaning, I think, towards, like, this idea of a soul, of an essence, right? It's just, it's basically, it's like your personality, right? Like, you are the person you are. 
in all these memory wipes, that doesn't really change anything because we're also not wiping right from the beginning of you. Mm -hmm. If I'm sure if we were doing a show where it was like they had a memory wipe at one week old or whatever it was, or like a very specific point in their life, you know, at 13 years old after they had their first kiss or something, memory wipe, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It'd be very different, but the essence of who they are has already been shaped and now we're seeing them. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's interesting though. Yeah. And there's a lot of material out there, fictional material, obviously, because none of this stuff can really be tested. Mm -hmm. Um, but as Chidi was showing on the chalkboard, like two different brains, but one self being split into two different bodies, Mm -hmm. which one is the real one? Right. Are they both the, the real one, even though one can branch off and do a whole bunch of things on their se- by themselves and have new experiences, etc., and the other one can have its own life? Which one is the real one? Yeah. Well, and even in this episode, no one is worried that there, there are five Janets in the void at once, right? Because as soon as we see them, despite the fact that they're they are Darcy Card and they look exactly like Janet. None of them think, oh, I'm Janet now. Or none of them are Janet all of a sudden. So the body right. doesn't seem to matter. Your form doesn't seem to matter. So their right? their spirit or their soul or whatever has... Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And um, you mentioned the thought experiment with splitting the brain and putting one half into one person and the other half into another person. Well, Chidi mentions a philosopher named Derek Parfit, and he actually came up with a thought experiment called the teletransporter, and it's basically, like, from Star Trek-like fan fiction. Um, <laughs> it's, it basically has, like, it's like a teleporter, so then if you were placed in a teleporter and you were completely, d- like, disintegrated and then transported... And then, sorry, and then, like, a teleporter on Mars basically recreated you, would you still be the same person? Right, right. Right? Because, yes, those molecules are in the same order, and you look the same, and you still remember what happened yesterday, and you still have the cut on your face from shaving, are you still the same person, or are you not the same person? Mm Mm-hmm. And would it be different if you literally just transported yourself, you know? Is that is that different? Like, right. how does that work? So, I just think, like, all these experiments are so fun on TV. Like, stuff well, that you're never, ever going to see. And it's such a popular trope in TV and film. Like, we got Freaky Friday. We have the hot chick. We have multiple Buffy episodes, right? And it's... I think it's just really fun and unexpected to see it in the good place. I never thought that I would. Mm -hmm. I'm happy that I got to see it. Yeah. And in uh, last year's Black Mirror episode, uh, USS Callister, Mm. that's, I mean, one of the main ideas is our main character is literally in a computer simulation. And she's also in the real world doing her job going about her day to day but which mm-hmm. is the real one like the one in the simulation thinks she's the real one because she's literally made up of the same stuff that the real life one is made out of so mm-hmm. there's that whole struggle of am i real mm-hmm. and it and- is it's so neat to think about and postulate and and then there's this like you were saying about the transporter thing there's a michael crichton book called timeline about time travel and the whole idea is they basically destroy their cells and rebuild them in the exact same way and Mm -hmm. are they themselves like the the characters have this whole inner panic of but wait i'm not me you're killing me in order to rebuild a new person who's not me but it is so like there's a whole couple pages of this philosophical struggle about wrapping their head around whether they can go through with it or Mm -hmm. whether it even is killing them it's like a suicide machine but being rebuilt and And that's that's the theory about current teleportation Mm -hmm. like that's the idea behind it is you break down all the cells and all the molecules and all the atoms etc and rebuild them the exact same way 
Right. So the problem being is that's still you. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes me think how... Human trials when? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But how are the humans entering the void and being spit out later as we see? Like, are those molecules just so quickly assembling? Or those atoms or whatever the heck. Um, Are they just so quickly assembling that it doesn't even register? Are they actually physically, like, shrinking and then becoming larger again? Are their bodies still on earth for their families to go and grieve over? Like, we don't know, but it's fun to think about. (laughs) So I feel like that's the tagline of this, like this entire podcast. We don't don't know, know, but but it's it's fun fun to to think think about. about. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And then Jason actually brings up a really good point. And that joke is so funny, too, when he says, I don't remember, but I definitely have, like, I don't remember how it happened, but I definitely have a tattoo on my butt that says Jason, which always makes me laugh. Even if we forget something that happens to us or something that we did, does that mean we're not the same person? Because that seems ridiculous to me. There are definitely evenings of fun and libations that I don't remember. (laughs) Um, So... And well, of course, there's moments where you're just, you've got that, like, highway hypnosis, or sure. you're just kind of on autopilot. You don't really remember. Do you remember your sixth birthday or your seventh year of existence? Like, does that mean no. you didn't happen? Or does that mean that you aren't the same person? Or you would be, like, memories. I am an ever-changing bundle of impressions, according to Hume. And that sounds about right to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> High five, Hume. All right, let's get back to Michael. Michael asks to see Doug Forsett's file, and Neil obliges. They discover that he's doomed as well. Michael argues that it doesn't make sense, but Neil counters that the points are indisputable. Michael asks to see the file of someone who went to the good place recently, but he discovers that no one has made it there in 521 years. Dun dun dun! What? Color me shocked. (laughs) <laughs> what color is shocked red. like yellow for electrocution no i was thinking of red hmm. i don't know okay anyway <laughs> <laughs> anyway okay so before we address the 521 years which is bonkers i just want to con- comment on neil's comment he says well the math is cold objective and airtight And no, sir, no, Neil, it is not, and it can't be. Yes, it is. No, it is not. And math has no decisions. It just is what it is. No, no, no. Okay. Because to me, it cannot be cold, objective, and airtight, blah, blah, blah. Neil, wrong. (laughs) The moral worth of an action can't be objective. We live in this impermanent and flexible world with a morality that's constantly in flux. So an action's moral worth has to be flexible as well, right? Like doing something years and years ago, uh, a woman wearing pants in 1497, which was the last year anyone got into the good place, was like socially unacceptable. So maybe that had some sort of like, uh uh-uh, thumbs down kind of moral. So you don't think these numbers are being updated? The moral worth is being updated? No, I don't think so. I don't think it could actually update. Like, it doesn't seem to me like it is. That would be a lot of work because every time a an action that has been repeated previously, literally any time anybody ever does anything, would have to be reevaluated the points. Yeah, and it doesn't seem to me like it is because we see this this machine, this main feed that says um, that all of these points are just given a certain worth and that's just how they are for the rest of time. Right. And that seems ridiculous. So if Grog lost a million points for killing Og with a rock, does that mean anyone who kills someone else with a rock loses the same amount of points? What if the situation is radically different, but the action is technically completed in the same way? So self-defense. Yeah. So self-defense or someone who uses a rock to kill a baby. That seems worse to me, right? That should probably have (laughs) two million points 
low, uh, whatever. Anyway, so, <laughs> ah, okay. No, I get it. I yes. get exactly what you're saying. So, yes, it's safe to say that it bothered me this episode. <laughs> You can't get mad at the numbers. The numbers no. are numbers, but it's the users that should be updating the, the values. Now, we don't know if this is not happening or not. It's very safe to say that it's not because mm-hmm. it seems like this main machine is just spouting out the numbers automatically. Mm-hmm. And if anything rare comes up, then it will ask for a reevaluation. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think it would need to be calibrated like... At least every year. Well, yeah. Like, not every year. Heck, every month? Every week? Things change quickly in this world. But... Very quickly. Time for this accounting department is very different. Like, 521 years might only feel like a blip for them because they've been doing it for, you know, thousands and thousands and millions. And... Yeah. Well, we know that Marcy or whoever is turning 39 million again Again. so yeah yeah so what i what that says is maybe neil the head of the accounting department doesn't realize that 521 years of nobody getting into the good place is a bad thing maybe Mm -hmm. he just doesn't realize that that's a long time for people on earth Mm -hmm. which is a problem (laughs) in itself (laughs) yes 100 (laughs) percent, it is a problem in itself Okay, so 521 years since anyone has been sent to the good place. So we can talk about that number. So that means the last year that someone got in was in 1497. I see, I hear this and it makes me wonder if the bad place really did hack this system because it seems plausible that the massive shift in technology and morality and the sheer amount of people on this earth could kind of account for this error. I mean, if you have people like Neil, who may be 521 years, it's not that big of a deal. Maybe he doesn't, you know, think so much about how quickly life is changing on Earth. Um, so, like, obviously the world has changed dramatically, but are the accountants factoring in the context of these actions? Mm-hmm. And with the shift there's going to have to be new point values associated to things that are no longer considered taboo or bad um, and new things that are cropping up every day that we consider bad, right? Like Uber drivers talking to you. That wasn't an issue in 1497. There were no Uber drivers. Was your cart driver talking to you and it was annoying? I don't know. It just seems like it would be so much easier to get into the bad place now because of this overwhelming amount of unwritten rules too right which like okay going back for two seconds this like hollowed out eggplant filled with nickels and hot sauce used as like a weird sex thing gross i guess right you guess whatever anyway yeah weird and definitely a little gross but who's he really hurting with that I'm just saying, who is he negatively affecting in his life by hollowing out an eggplant and filling it with hot sauce and nickels? You don't Except have to for be, maybe his n- own genitalia. You don't have to be negatively affecting somebody else to get negative points. Mm, but that's how I see it, is like the good or the bad that you put into the world. How are you putting out anything good or bad? But he's not progressing himself in any way. Maybe he's maybe a continuous use of this eggplant will shift him into some kind of eggplant crazed maniac who goes on a eggplant stealing rampage in a grocery store and runs over thirteen old ladies in the process. Yeah, but you can't you can't predict the future. You're just evaluating that action in that moment. Mm-hmm. So in that moment, yeah, maybe he's not doing something that's super healthy or normal, but who is he hurting with the eggplant is what I'm asking. Who? Who, Jason? Tell the me. eggplant? <laughs> the eggplant's not sentient. Anyway. Okay. Okay. That Off doesn't, of that stop, track. That doesn't that track. stop Doug from doing his bit with the snails. They're not sentient. They don't really have brains. No, but they move around. Eggplants don't. They grow. Yeah, and then they stop growing once you pick them off. <laughs> Anyway, so <laughs> off that topic. Shall we talk about what Michael Schur has said about this episode back in December after it aired? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, he said in an interview with Variety on December 6th, 
He said, we chose roughly 500 years because we figured that once the world was sort of closed as a loop, so once exploration moved from Western Europe across the ocean, that was basically, uh, after that moment, it was essentially impossible for anyone to live a life to get in by the criteria that we've set up. Right. So after the discovery of the new world, Mm -hmm. that's when nobody could get in because the criteria that they set up for the points right still in effect exactly so michael sure is basically confirming that the point value haven't been changed depending on the context that those actions take place right they just keep adding new scenario new point values to new scenarios yeah so a scenario that might have existed in the past still exists today and they still get the same points but it good al- or bad. It also seems like some actions, maybe good actions, are being evaluated in the context of now because right. someone like, you know, back in fourteen ninety seven, maybe they were a great person because they would share a loaf of bread with their neighbor, or they took care of um, someone elderly in their family, or whatever. Those kinds of like basic kind things that you can do in your community right here and there but then you have tahani who raises like 60 million dollars for charity and just still goes to the bad place so i don't know yeah that's uh (laughs) in another interesting in another interview um he said it was always reserved for the elite top five percent so we figured that once western expansion began everyone was screwed and why so he says it like that's just well that's obvious but like why is it only the top five percent why not the top 50 and then he said that um all these answers all these questions would be answered the next episode Ah, so which i'm just dying to watch yeah okay so do you think that there's some kind of collusion happening here Do you think there's like a secret agreement between the accountants and the good place to eliminate the competition? Like this idea of just 5% of people can get in. We've got to keep this an exclusive club. Instead of like a 50-50 scenario? Yeah. Because if that's how it is, if they are making it like an exclusive club, kind of this, you know, 1% that we've talked about so much in, in our society... It would make sense that an action like a destination-themed wedding would doom you to eternal suffering because maybe the top 5% of people wouldn't bother to do something like that because they would give all of their money to, I don't know, a bus driver Sure. that they saw that day <laughs> because they're nice people. Right. I'm just wondering, like, maybe if it's been going on since the beginning when Og gave his rock to Grog, right? Yeah, now if you give a rock to somebody... But in that situation, shouldn't you be able to just get millions of points by giving a rock to someone if the point values haven't changed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I give you a pebble, does that give me a million points? Does that get you access to the good place suddenly? I'm going to give you a pebble tomorrow. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) And this kind of makes me wonder, too, like, way in the future, if if all of our kind of theories here um, do end up being true... Um, it makes me wonder how they're going to rectify this error. So (laughs) maybe all the truly deserving people in the good place are going to have their memories wiped, um, in the afterlife so far so that they don't remember this like 5% of people good place where it's like perfect and pristine and very underpopulated. And then they just become a more populated good place or... There are different kinds of good place. Be interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wonder what Michael's gonna try and do. Mm-hmm. And how does Mindy St. Clair fit into all of this? I know, right? Outlier. The definition of okay. Moving on. Yes, moving on. Because believe me, I could get into the weeds on this <laughs> if I haven't already. Jason and Tahani discover that Jason and Janet were once married. Eleanor experiences an identity crisis that threatens to collapse Janet's world. Chidi finally admits his feelings and kisses Eleanor, which stops the collapse and returns everyone back to themselves. Okay. Cool. So, getting a little bit of a, like, romance section here. Mm -hmm. Jason and Janet were once married. 
Jason doesn't seem to be at all bothered by any of this or even surprised or have any real reaction. (laughs) Um, Hoping that comes into play next episode. And then we get Eleanor's identity crisis, which I actually really like. I, I like the effect of her changing into all of these different forms. Um, and I think it's cool that at first all the forms are wearing her clothes. And then as things start getting worse and worse, you just see people wearing all different kinds of clothing and none of them look anything like her. Mm -hmm. And we get to see at the last few seconds when Chidi is panicking and about to say, because I love you, we get to see many different people with a tear on their face. Um, I think it's a really good way of showing that she's losing her grip on herself. And then, of course, we get that kiss. The kiss! Oh, my God! The The kiss. The kiss of a thousand Janets. Yes! The kiss of Janet kissing Janet. (laughs) And then Eleanor kissing Janet. And then Eleanor kissing Chidi. Oh, yeah. We're just missing Chidi kissing Jason and Jason kissing Tahani and Tahani kissing Eleanor and Eleanor kissing Jason and (laughs) which ones did I miss? (laughs) But yeah, I really, really like that. It was a lot of fun to watch. It was very sweet. I really like it because it's a a fun reversal because Chidi's usually the one who's completely spiraling and Eleanor's the one that brings him back. Mm -hmm. And... In this episode, Eleanor is really the only one who's witnessed this other timeline. And I think that's that's interesting because we see her be the most um, unstable in this episode. She's much more shaky on who she is because she's also seen a different version of herself. So, yeah. They chose the right, the right person. And that's how I feel about that. And that's how I feel about that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I noticed in your notes you wrote, is that really Pillboy? So when yeah. Jason conjures up his broken hot tub, of yeah. course it's broken. Well, he was just thinking about Pillboy, right. you know, he was missing him. So, I mean, we discussed this in length earlier on in mm-hmm. this episode, but I think it's Pillboy. I like, don't. It's Pillboy as Jason knows him. So it's... Does that mean that it's not Pillboy? Because for all Jason knows, it's probably got all his characteristics, all his memories, everything. I don't think that's Pillboy. I would disagree. Because someone's interpretation of you is not you. Right? And so the okay. way, like, if I if I was conjured in um, Janet's Void by my mother, I would be a very different person than if I was conjured into Janet's Void by you. Mm-hmm. Right? You show different sides to different people. I think I know myself better than anyone else on this planet. You're probably next on that list. But I don't think that's Pillboy. Okay. I just think that's what Jason knows of Pillboy. Right. Okay. That's a very good point. Yeah. You know, your memories of someone is not who they are. Yeah. And then it get we get into the whole, if that's Pillboy, is that a copy of Pillboy? Is that Pillboy actually on Earth somehow being manifested and like zapped into the... Right the void so have you brought you to my line of thinking yep oh no i totally agree cool win i'm gonna put that right on my chalkboard okay (laughs) chalkboard sounds i like that joke (laughs) that he says i was just chilling being nothing and then when he as he's disappearing (laughs) he's like oh no i'm not again (laughs) yeah just not in existence anymore (laughs) so what did you think of eleanor's identity crisis and the kiss and everything to do with Chidi and Eleanor what'd you think I thought it was great it was really good seeing like you mentioned Eleanor being the one to spiral out of control in this time like she's you know usually the grounded one Mm -hmm. even though she may not show it all the time she's got feelings and emotions and finally this is where it starts to crumble Yeah, she's 100% the leader of this group. So to see her have a moment of insecurity um, in a way that we've never seen before is nice. It's just, it seemed like she was so desperate for Chidi to accept his feelings that she started to fall apart. Mm -hmm. Because she knew that they were real. 
like those feelings were there, but Mm -hmm. just pulling them out of him. Mm -hmm. Neil refuses to believe Michael, and he tells him to go to the good place and take it up with the committee. Janet encourages Michael to take action, to fix what's wrong with the afterlife. When Eleanor's identity crisis ends, the four humans are ejected from Janet's void. They appear in the accounting department, and they're immediately identified as fugitives. Michael takes action, and he escapes, takes the Book of Dogs, and transports everyone via pneumatic tube to an unstaffed office in the good place. Oh my god. Holy forking shirt balls, we're in the good place! I'm so excited! It's been a long time coming. Ah! I wondered if we were ever going to see the good place. Me too. I mean, it was it was really touch and go for a while. It was like, uh, does it not even exist? Mm-hmm. Has this been like some giant lie that everyone's been, you know, feeding into? And yeah, yeah. They're there. They're We're actually there. there. Michael, sure Michael con- said that. He confirmed it. Yeah. For sure. So, okay. Zoom, zoom, backing up. That's not a backing up noise. I don't know how to make a rewind noise. <laughs> you got to beep. You got to beep like a truck backing up. Beep, beep, beep. beep, beep. beep. So let's back up. <laughs> Neil says, go and take it up with the committee. The good place committee. There's a good place committee? What does that committee do? What's the Who's point of the, the accounting department when if there's a committee? Meet? Do they have donuts there? Anyway, huh, I just, I need to see this committee I'm really, really hoping that there wasn't like some one-off line, and I don't think it will be because Michael's reaction was like, what the heck are you talking about when he said it? So Michael doesn't even know that this good place committee exists, and maybe, just maybe, this is the committee that's being all snooty-nosed, only 5% of people are allowed. So yeah, I want to see them. Who should it be? A bunch of old white guys. Because they would be the ones who are excluding people. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. I don't know. I don't have very high opinions of the good place right now. So I'm imagining it as like, (laughs) oh, they're the air quotes good place, you know, but it's really not that good. Yeah. Because it's a bunch of old white guys. Anyway. Well, I don't really have anything to say about that last moment, except they're in the mail room, obviously. Mm -hmm. The, The tubes send up the the people's points to the mailroom and yeah it seems pretty empty up there maybe because nothing gets sent to the good place in 500 years so they're uh they're on break an extended yeah. break <laughs> the government's been shut down oh no we've been watching a lot of parks and Rec. So. Yeah. um i really want leslie nope to be there i would love if amy poehler was on this show for just a second yeah anyway um so the good place it's real it's interesting because it's not like this super modern like looking place either they're keeping the aesthetic of the show yeah they are they are but they've got kind of like an old timey like that post office is a little bit old school for sure you know which is interesting like the rest of the good place or the bad place but the good place that we had in season one was like fairly modern right which good place eleanor's um well the good place neighborhood that we saw in season one yep Like, Michael's office, for example, didn't have that style. It was a little bit more sleek, a little bit more modern. I'm thinking of Michael's office in the bad place as he's being an architect. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, um... That's fair. Because the neighborhoods would all be different, right? Yeah. If we're going with what Michael said is true in season one. And Sean's office. Yes. And and the train is old-timey and... Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's true. Bring some of that old-world charm. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Um... So the censoring thing is legit, which I don't love. I think it's a really fun way to, like, show that we really are in the good place. That's fun to me. Mm -hmm. I still don't like this idea of censoring people being a good thing Mm. and a thing that a good place would do. If you haven't heard that argument in a while, go back to season one because I'm pretty sure I was fired up about it. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of how I feel now, so. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting topic. To discuss yeah. whether censoring is good or bad. Yeah. So anyway, we're here. We're in the good place. I'm so excited. So excited. I really feel like the last three episodes of the season are going to be a uh, Amazing. freaking roller coaster. And I am like first on that line. 
I'm going down that roller coaster. Let's go. Let's go. You're strapped in. You're yep. in the front seat. You're, 100%. You're, you're ready to go. I'm ready for the ride of my life. All right. Well, before we go, I just wanted to mention my favorite line and my favorite moment of the episode Ooh, because yes. I mentioned that Jason was just perfect. Mm. And right at the beginning... Chidi's yelling. He's like, where is down? He's freaking <laughs> out. And Jason somehow is on the ceiling or uh, upside down. And he's like, yo, I found it. It's up here. It's dope. <laughs> it's my favorite line that Jason has ever said. Down is up here. <laughs> first of all, how did he get there? Did he just jump and flip himself? Or did he like will himself? Like, I don't know. He it just breakdanced himself all the way sure, up that's, there. That's very plausible. And like, I found down. It's up here. Yeah. And it's dope. <laughs> <laughs> how can a direction be dope? I don't know. But I love it. It's so good. Uh, yeah, I could. W- I watched that moment over and over and over again. The delivery is amazing. <laughs> the one, there are a couple little lines that I watched like several times were when um, Jason is pretending to be Eleanor and he says, I'm Arizona shrimp horny. <laughs> and Eleanor's I don't just say like, that. That's not how I talk. <laughs> that was hilarious. And uh, also Cheaty when he's like, well, because freaking out about everything is my identity. Not to brag. <laughs> Great moment. Darcy Carden was fantastic in this episode. She needs to win an Emmy. And if not, just boycott all the Emmys. Except and... for our Emmy. All right. Our cat. Yes. Um, we got You're not going to hear her in this episode because she's a very quiet cat. Yeah. She's lovely. And I will probably be posting a picture of her. At the microphone. <laughs> On our Twitter, which gets us into the next part. Um... Not yet. No? I also did a little bit of background research here. When Chidi says that one of Eleanor's, you know, things that she likes to do as she's spiraling out of control is to watch the John Travolta, <laughs> the Adele Dazeem incident over and over again. I didn't even know that was a thing. I just watched it today. How did that happen? I know. Who wrote Adina Menzel's name? On that card because I looked, I did, uh, I watched the the talk show where he was talking and explaining how it happened. And John Travolta's like, a different page was there handing me the new cards. I got distracted. I was talking with Goldie Hawn. I was starstruck. I thought I had 15 minutes to prep. I had 15 seconds. (laughs) And they typed out her name phonetically on the page. Instead of what her actual name is. And when I got up on the stage and looked at it, I didn't know what it was because I didn't recognize the name because it was spelled differently. (laughs) So he was saying, yeah, and but they're good friends. And like Adina was laughing about it. And she says that she's owes a lot of her popularity to John Travolta's (laughs) flub for that. And I don't know. I just thought it was kind of funny. Oh, celebrities. They're just like us. Exactly. I flub words all the time. I do it right here. Um. (laughs) Also, let's savor the fact that the first person in 521 years to get into the good place is Jason. Oh, wow. Yep. (laughs) Oh, dip. (laughs) I'm in the good place. It's dope. Good for you, Jason. Good for you. All right. So the next episode... Which came out yesterday. Sorry about the delay again. Is titled The Book of Dugs. Um, really excited to see what that's going to be about. Really excited to see this good place. Uh, yeah, only three episodes left this season. And then we're going to go on hiatus. Sad. Okay. Wah, wah. Wah, wah. So, that brings us to the end of Forking Bullshit, a multiverse radio production. If you like our show, please leave us a glowing rating and a stunning review on iTunes. This is the absolute best way for other people to find the show, as is also sharing it on social media and telling people at the bus stop about it. And yeah, do all those things. If you want to get in touch with us, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio. You can tag your thoughts with hashtag FBullshirt. We're also on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. And if you want to send us your more lengthy thoughts, you can email us on our website at www.multiverseradio.ca. 
And that's us, signing off. Until next time, I'm Jason. And I'm B. Bye. Bye.